My name is Patrick McGinnis, and I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic, and it's changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show about finding the power to choose what you actually want in business and life and the courage to miss out on everything else. I'm Patrick McGinnis, your host and the creator of the term FOMO, and I'm here today talking about something totally different on FOMO Sapiens. Ever since I started this show, I've wanted to have a young person on the show, but I never kind of knew who the right person was, and I decided that just let the universe provide that to me, and then boom, I meet today's guest, uh, who is somebody who has got a totally interesting perspective on the world, and so I decided to invite him in here uh, as a person of his age who can tell us how young people see the world and also tell us a lot about a lot of other things, because Diego is a young man of action, having started several companies, uh, so if you've ever wanted to challenge yourself, build something new, um, or get out of your comfort zone, uh, you can actually learn a lot from, from our guest today. And that guest is Diego Gonzalez. He is a 12-year-old entrepreneur that currently attends Hunter College High School in New York City. His current venture is MicroLisa, a health device that diagnoses lung cancer in a cheap and safe way. He has won first place at the Higher Ed Blockchain Hackathon held at the Parsons School Design, second place at the Techstars Startup Weekend, and second place at the MIT Grand Hack for Medicine. His writings have been featured in the Parenthetical and the Ellipsis, and I have him here with me today, Diego. Hey, welcome to FOMO Sapiens. Thanks for having me over. Yeah, it's good to have you. How are you doing today? Tired. <laughs> tired. This is You're not supposed to be tired. You're 12. <laughs> All right, so... So, um, pretty awesome bio there, I'm going to say. Yeah, I, was very, I really enjoyed reading it. I'm sure you enjoyed doing all those things. <laughs> um, but I want to start out with the question that I always ask my guests when they come on the show, which is, everybody feels a little FOMO. It's natural. So, what is it that turns you into a FOMO sapien? Um, well, I really feel that like the stuff that turns me into a, a FOMO sapien and gives me FOMO is really like the social life around me, less the academic life, because there's nothing that I'm really missing out there. <laughs> um, but I feel that if like I don't have something for like a certain weekend and I come back the next day, everybody will be laughing about something and I won't know what that is and I'll like kind of miss out on that. I feel like I have to divide my time into like so many places. Yeah, so you're a busy guy, you gotta decide what to focus on. I mean, these are, these are eternal problems that I guess a lot of us have, but it's good to know that um, it's good to know that you recognize it anyway, right? Yeah. So before we get going and talk about specifics, I just want to kind of tell, tell everybody about yourself, where you're from, tell us about your family, what you like to do, what's your day job, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm 12. Um, I live here in uh, NYC. It's the best city in the world, and I'm proud to be here. Um, but uh, just for me, my day job is going to school. Um, studying, getting good grades, and uh, my hobbies are like really just like being an entrepreneur, student by day, entrepreneur by night, um, and just like hanging out with my family and friends. That's cool. So that's a ten percent entrepreneur yeah. right there, if I ever heard of one. Ten um, percent entrepreneur, and if you, I'm sure many of our listeners know, but somebody who has a day job or studies and then has entrepreneurial ventures on the side, which you have done, yeah. as we heard about in the intro. So uh, tell me about. I mean, you've been at this, when, first of all, when did you first do your first venture? How did that go? What are your new ventures? Like, how, what are the kinds of things you've done in the world of entrepreneurship? Um, well, uh, by, like, uh, really venture ventures, um, mm -hmm. I feel like the first one has uh, really been a student peer, one that I did at the uh, Techstars Weekend Hackathon, um, which was a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, tutoring system. Um, but... Like, way before that, um, when I was little, uh, well, when I was how, little, yeah. I am little. How little, uh, how little are you talking? Like, uh, like, was, like, uh, like seven or eight. Okay. Um, uh, what I did uh, was that I went to this entrepreneurial market, and at that time I'd been, like, writing a bunch of stories. And I uh, folded them up, stapled them together, and uh, went to the market and kind of sold them. Wow. And then that was really, like, one of the first entrepreneurial things that I did. And how do you, as you think about this, like, 
Where did you get the idea to start working on these projects? Did you read something? Did you see something? Is it something that you did with your family? Like, where did it all come from? Um, so it really came from, uh, uh, like, a night when uh, I was five. And uh, my dad uh, kind of, we were just settling down uh, to go to sleep. And he uh, opened uh, his laptop and he handed me one. And he showed me this program called Scratch, which um, MIT developed to try to teach kids how to code. And he kind of showed me around. We watched some quick YouTubes, uh, closed the laptops. And the next day, uh, we went to uh, Scratch Day, which was an event where uh, basically a bunch of like people came together and showed their ideas on Scratch. And then from there, I just, um, I really like enjoyed coding. So I went to a, well, I don't know if it was a summer camp, kind of, mm -hmm. um, called Pixel Academy, where I learned uh, how to code in Unity and C++ and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I really like this coding kind of stuff. And then uh, when I was, like, in uh, second grade, um, I, some of my friends were doing this uh, writing workshop, and I really wanted to join in on that. So um, I signed myself up, and basically I wrote my stories and then would stand in front of people and read it to them, kind of like practicing how to get over my now non-existent fear of public speaking. Wow. Yeah, I know. You're doing really well, by the way. I mean, Thanks. Congratulations. So... Um, so, so you talk about these these ventures that you started. I'm curious. Um, first of all, how many of your, do most of your friends also do this, or are, are most of your friends coding? Like, how many kids at, the, at your school are doing these kinds of things? Are you kind of unique in that way? I'm just just wondering. Yeah, I don't think anybody does these things. I know a lot of kids who like code, but they do that so that they can create video games and stuff, um, which was originally like my side of it. Um, yeah because my parents didn't let me play video games. They were like, no. And I kind of thank them for that, because that's like one of the reasons why I kept going on with coding. They were like, if you can code your own, I have no problem with you playing it. Wow, you hear that, parents? It's kind of it's, <laughs> it's funny you say that. Last night I was at a friend's house. These people, their, their friends are, he's from Argentina, she's um, Canadian, and she made all these cookies. And I said like, wow, these cookies are great. Did you make them yourself? And she said, my mother had one rule when I was a kid. We would never buy anything that was out of the store or out of a, out of a box, but if we could figure out how to make it ourselves, she'd get the ingredients for anything. So she knew how to make cakes and cookies and everything. It's kind of the same thing. It's like, we're not going to buy you the video game, but we're going to let you to build it yourself. Yeah. Wow. And so tell me, so you, 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 you started going to these hackathons and you had support from your, your family. And then, you know, you did your first kind of one, which was this student peer to peer network. And so like, how did it go? Um, I it assume it's, well. on the, it's now traded publicly on the stock market? Or? No, no. <laughs> um, no, that really didn't turn into, like, much. Um, uh, just because of, like, some restraints, like, within uh, trying to get into um, my own school. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, I went to this hackathon. It was one weekend. I showed up there the first day. Uh, I wasn't, um, I wasn't like registered for the hackathon or anything, which is usually how like I start out at hackathons. My uh, dad kind of finds one. He goes and mentors, try to like offer his skills, and I tag along every time. And then like suddenly like I feel I felt this inspiration. I got the microphone. I went up. I pitched my idea, and they actually selected mine. Wow. Uh, they voted on them, and then the like top five were uh, kind of selected, and then that was one of mine. So my dad signed me up. And uh, I, for the rest of the day, I worked on it, um, built a team, kind of sat down figuring out some things about it. And then next day I got a fever, so I had to stay home. Entrepreneurial uh, fever. <laughs> they're the best. Um, uh, so I came in like uh, halfway into the next day um, and kept working and stuff. And then I, like, kept feeling really sick. So, like, uh, a couple minutes before the final pitch, I uh, arrived at the place. Uh, like, my idea had changed a lot because they'd been, like, working at it and stuff. I read the pitch, looked at the slide deck, um, and got up there and pitched it. And I think it went really well. That's awesome. And that's the great thing about having a team, right, is that yeah. maybe, you know, you can't be there the whole time. But if you had shared your vision, then people can continue working on it. And so th now that was the, which business was that one? That was uh, the student peer one. Okay. And so you did that one and I know it's no longer in, in yeah. living. So we, so I guess it was a failure. So how did that feel? I mean, how, you know, a lot of people are afraid of failure. What do you, what's your thought on failure? Um, well, my thought is kind of, you know, hope for the best and plan for the worst. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, as a kid, 
I'm not really afraid of failure because if anything does go south, then I can still go home, eat some scoops of ice cream, and, like, feel normal again. Yeah. You know, so um, that's why I think it's, like, important to start at an early age for entrepreneurship because there's just so much more, like, availability and options because you don't have to be as scared or have things go, like, as great because if something does go wrong, you still have a place to go to and... Like stay there. Right, you got a, you got a roof over your head. Yeah. Does he, do, I'm curious. Do, do you learn like do, do schools teach entrepreneurship these days? Um, not really. I've uh, been lucky to have some really great teachers. Um, so uh, one of my teachers uh, last year, she uh, showed us like a bunch of like TED talks on entrepreneurs and stuff, uh-huh. and we learned about like uh, being gritty and stuff like that. So that definitely helped. Um, but no, it's not really taught as part of the curriculum, which I feel like is. Big mistake. Right there. Yeah, that's a big opportunity. An opportunity for an entrepreneur to solve, maybe. Yeah. Um, and you think about, you know, you said, obviously, your dad has been a huge impact on you. Do you have certain entrepreneurs that you look up to that inspire you, that kind of help you to think about, okay, maybe I could do this someday? Um, no, not really, because there's none that are, like, my age that right. I really know of. Right. Um, but, uh, like, other, anybody out there, really, just, like, figuring out what they did right and what they did wrong and uh, seeing how I could learn from that is really helpful. Right, and you have learned. I mean, as you go ahead and do these ventures, like, what have, what have been the big things that you've learned as you've kind of tried different things and succeeded or failed or changed or pivoted? Like, what are your big learnings? Um, well, I really think um, at the same uh, uh, hackathon, the Latin X one, you show up the first day, there are a bunch of people interested in your idea. Some join in, some leave, uh, some go for other groups. So I think the idea is definitely important, but it's not the most important thing. If you have a really uh, strong team that can stick together, if that idea goes wrong, you can pitch another one and go working at that. And then um, if it's not really the vision they're focused on, but the team itself, then they can like pivot easily to go whichever way they need to. Right. And for those who haven't been to a hackathon, I imagine some of our listeners have been to a hackathon, but probably a lot haven't. What is what is a hackathon? Like, how um, does it work? So it's usually a, a one weekend thing that starts uh, uh, like late night on Friday. Mm. Um, so a bunch of uh, smart people uh, come together and try to hack some of the world's problems and... Yeah. By hack, I don't mean, like, computer right, viruses not, and stuff. I mean, right, like... Not the dark web. Yeah. <laughs> coming together and uh, figuring out a solution for it. Um, sometimes using uh, machines and uh, technology, but other times simply, like, uh, creating it from scratch. Those are m- called more make-a-thons right. instead of hackathons, but really? same kind of idea. I didn't actually... I've never heard that term before. I learned something new today. Yeah. And so as you go to these, you know, I know you, you have this new venture you're working on, which is, which you, I'd love if you talk about that and how you came up with the idea. And, and is this the one where you got the free office space? Is that right? Uh, no, no. I got a, a free office space in Soho from the student peer one. Okay, everybody, everybody who's listening to this <laughs> podcast, if you need office space in Soho, call Diego because he has an office space. I might take you up on that. I mean, that's, that's awesome. Um, okay, so... Talk, let's. I'd love to hear about this new the the lung the lung um, cancer business. Um, so basically, it was at the Grand Hack uh, hosted by MIT um, at Mount Sinai, and uh, uh, it was really I came in there having minimal knowledge. Uh, my dad being a mentor and uh, having me uh, brought me along. Uh, this time, a friend had also uh, come along, which was a rare occurrence. The first. Um, but I went there and, uh, turns out we got the lung cancer track, which was one of them. So I did some quick facts about lung cancer and, uh, I saw like, oh, it's tumors over here. Um, and then, uh, a guy came up on stage and he presented that if you could diagnose it earlier, like the survival rates would like go like way up and mm-hmm. like people wouldn't die. And I was like, why hasn't anybody like really taken that into account? And then, um... We went to our separate tracks, to our room and stuff, and then uh, they said, uh, whoever has an idea, come up and pitch. I was like, whoa, like, I have an idea. Why don't we just detect, like, lung cancer earlier? Um, And my friend was like, wait, you can't do that. Like, these are all adults, right? And I was like... Somebody should somebody should have told me that earlier, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so, uh, and he was like, "Oh, okay, uh, go ahead." So I went up there and I kind of was like, "Wait, like, why do does everyone think that like this is just for adults? This is for anybody?" Yes. 
Um, and I went up there, I pitched my idea. I was like, God, oh, let's detect lung cancer earlier. Um, I don't really know how to do it, but let's figure it out. Uh, and then we uh, kind of huddled around our ideas and waited for people to like, come to try to join our teams. And uh, nobody came to mind. <laughs> there was one person who came, and then I saw everybody kind of drifting over to like group number one. So I was like, oh, let's go figure out what's going on over there. And then he was like, oh, uh, let's use um, like app-based uh, stuff, I think, uh, um, to try to, you know, build uh, something to try to detect earlier. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. But one of the major problems with this issue is that smokers don't want to actually go get the test done. Yes. Um, so I was like, what if we like seamlessly integrated it into like uh, like annually or monthly checkups, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like a mammogram. Yes. You know, um, and then he was like, oh, yeah, that can't be done. I was like, can we make it a shot? You know, just stick it into me and like tell me. And, and then uh, everybody around me, uh, there were like uh, some scientific engineers and stuff. And they were like, well, I, I guess like we could kind of make that work. And then uh, the next day came around, uh, that same team kind of huddled around. And we figured out that if we could make it some kind of thing where you uh, pinch your finger as like a diabetic test, like that would be really easy and seamlessly integrated. So uh, throughout the rest of the hackathon, we kind of figured out some specifics, and uh, we came out with this idea for a product and this business plan. Um, and now we're just taking some next steps to further that. That's so cool. And what I love about your story, I mean, for those who, first of all, if I remember when I was a, an MBA student, there was a business plan competition, and I didn't join, I didn't enter, because I guess I was like, oh, I don't have an idea, or I don't know what that is, or... Now I look back and I'm like, what a lost opportunity, right? So I always tell people, if you have the opportunity to do something like this, do it. Because what's the worst that can happen? It's one weekend of your life. And if you fail, yeah. you can still go home and have your ice cream, right? Yeah. <laughs> but number two is, what I love about what you just told us is that you didn't know going in what this was. It wasn't like you had some big idea that you've been no. researching for six months. No. And you had the the curiosity to say like here's an idea like and work with other people which is exactly how entrepreneurs build companies so i think it's just a great lesson for anybody who might wonder how these things actually happen or how they might do it is to go in with a maybe a vision and then be really open-minded about what the solution could be that's pretty yeah. cool um and so what do you think, you know, as, you, as you're in these rooms and you have people of, you know, that may see like, oh, he's just a kid. Like, do you have, do you find that people generally are supportive or do you have some people that give you a little attitude? Like, how do you deal with those things? Um, so really, for the most part, what I try to do um, when I am there is like everybody, their first thing is like, whoa, like that's a kid. And then uh, I, they're like, oh, like he's probably just gonna like be here like with his dad and stuff. And then uh, what I try to do is like be the first person who pitches. Yeah. So I like uh, go up there and they're like, oh, like he's gonna say, oh, why don't we just cure cancer and stuff? <laughs> and then I like come up with this great idea and like, whoa, like that actually makes sense. That's amazing. And then the thing that I like really see and realize is that like not only do I inspire like people of my age, but also like people that are older than me. They go like, well, if he can do it, like I can too. And then after that, like everybody started lining up to pitch because they were like, yes. you know, this 12 year old kid just came up here and gave me this great idea. I'm pretty sure I can do that. So it kind of works both And maybe ways. their ideas aren't as good as yours, but at least they have the courage. I mean, I'm sure there are some really stinky ones, and yours is a really good one, so it's not easy to get as good an idea. But it's great that – I think it's great that people feel comfortable taking a little risk. As you've mentioned before, I mean, it's all about – what's so um, important is pe we tend to be our own worst enemy. And if you just have the courage to try, maybe you will have a good idea. So it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, what is uh, – as you think about um, mistakes – I'm sure that you do once in a while make a mistake. What's the biggest <laughs> mistake you've made and what did you learn from it? Um, well, one of uh, the great mistakes that I've made really is um, not preparing the pitch deck enough mm. because uh, when you think of your idea in your head, you're like, well, this is the best idea. This is the greatest idea. I want to make like a gazillion dollars off of it. But if not everybody sees your idea as that, then they're just like, next. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> next. <laughs> so um, really focusing on the pitch deck and trying to, 
communicate the idea to the world and not only see it as this great vision inside your head is really important. And what do you think, uh, like, let's fast forward, so, you know, the, the amazing thing about, and I, I think we all learn this as you get older, is like you're not, you know, you, every year you get one year older. And so some, at some point you may be the oldest person in the room someday, right? But as you think about where you want to be in five years when you're 18, I guess that's six years if I do, I got to do my math. Um, <laughs> Or, you know, you think about, like, what you want to study or, I don't know, some people say you don't even need to go to school to be an entrepreneur. I, I, I'd encourage you to consider going to college. I think that would be a good experience. But what do you think you, uh, having learned all these things now, like, what do you, what do you want to do? Um, well, that's a question I get asked a lot. Mm-hmm. Like, um, on the side, I also uh, dance. Um, I, uh, I can use a DJ set, you know, mm-hmm. I, uh, ballet, tab, jazz, ballroom. Wow. I do a lot of things on the side. I can write pretty well. Um, and I pride myself on being like, okay at a lot of sports. A polymath. Yeah. So, um, when people go like, what do you want to do? I'm like, well, there's just so many things that I can do. Um, I think entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur is one of the best because you can combine all these things that you really like to do and figure out a way to like communicate these ideas with other people. Maybe like you can use your dance skills to try to promote um, uh, you know, fundraisers for diseases and stuff. And maybe you could use that incredible soccer skill to like try to figure out um, how to build like an app to find pickup games easier and like that kind of stuff. So um, being an entrepreneur is a really great way to incorporate things from like all aspects of your life and try to create into a vision. And then eventually, of course, make some like hard cash off of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you need it. Of course, you want to pay the bills, but it's true. What you've said is is uh, there are so many people, and it's that are when they're younger and you know growing up, they they do lots of stuff. They do sports and music and dance and you know maybe start a small business. Like not everybody does all those things, but like you know some of those things, right? I remember when I was um, probably around your age, I had like. 50 gazillion hobbies. I was a lot like, I was, you know, a lot like you. And, um, and then when I went to college and I started working, I had like no free time. And so I didn't do anything. And now that I'm more entrepreneurial, I have, I'm able to integrate the things I love into my day job. So definitely one of the benefits of entrepreneurship is you have the flexibility to decide what you want to do all the time. And so you can take all your talents and apply them, which is really cool. Tell me something. I want to switch gears a little bit here because now that I have, I'm, now I'm going to make you like my, my guinea pig and my, <laughs> and my um, and for all of us who like wonder what's going on in the life of a 12 year old. Um, obviously, you're a New York City 12 year old, so that's yes. different. That's a specific breed of 12 year old. Yeah. Um, but tell me about your technology use. Like, do you have a cell phone? Do you have social media accounts? Like, what's going on there? Oh, this little guy right here. Boom. There uh, it is. So uh, I do have a cell phone. Um, it matches the cup. Oh, if, you, if you can't see this if you're, if you're listening, but we have cups on set that kind of match his phone. <laughs> so anyway. Um, so uh, my phone, like I mostly uh, just use uh, to text my friends and stuff like that. Um, I feel like, oh, well, my parents feel like I use my phone like a whole lot. Um, and I also feel like I use my phone like maybe a bit too much more than... Uh, is good for me, um, but I also feel that like relative to other people, like I see people who like go like, oh, like what do you mean? Oh, my screen time was only eight hours yesterday. And I'm <laughs> like, wait, what? So you just spent like uh, maths, one sec, a third of your day uh, on your phone. Half of your waking day, right? Assuming you're getting your eight um, hours, which nobody does, but still. <laughs> <laughs> um, like just being on your phone and this is like a giant, waste of time actually because you could be doing so many other things and it said you were just like scrolling through your instagram feed and stuff yes and speaking of that do you have instagram no i don't have any social media do do your friends have that that's by choice yeah good for do do most of your friends have them (laughs) yeah most of my friends uh do have everything um they're really like glued onto them and i'm kind of worried what does your school do like does your school control this kind of stuff oh my school is uh the best if you're a phone user it's uh if you're in the classroom uh don't get caught with your phone on <laughs> if you're in the hallways wow it's a, whatever it's open rain yeah and what about um you know just in general like h- how many um how many hours a day do you think you're like using the internet and your phone and stuff like that uh well my phone i only use like maybe an hour or 45 minutes a day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but like using, using, I probably only use like 30 minutes. Um, but the internet I use a lot and that's because um, all of my homework is online, uh, Google Drive, 
uh, Google Docs, Word, and I'm just using all of these things and typing a bunch. Um, so I feel like I definitely use the internet like at least like three to four hours a day, yeah. maybe less. In New York school, I mean, obviously it's like totally integrated. Yeah. School. It's, you have to understand for like anybody who grew up before the internet was, it's yeah. like kind of a mind blower. I'm like, whoa, like you have your computer and you're, you have like a, do you have tablets or you have like computers? No, uh, I, we don't have computers um, in school. We have them outside of school, but everything gets uploaded to a website. So instead of like having to keep track of all your homework assignments in your head, you just go on the website, click on it, and then you have your homework assignment. And basically uh, the thing that they do is they give you a Google account. And then from there, you kind of just organize your drive with all the files. So you type up your English homework, you type up your social studies homework. Mm. Sometimes you even type up your math homework. Um, and then you just have them all there. So then, like, whenever something happens, maybe you're at a school and you have some free time, right? You can just, like, open up, like, any computer anywhere and wow. then just keep working on your, like, research paper. And you, like, email with your teachers and stuff? Um... No, not really. I feel like I did it like a lot last year. But they um, give you their email address or like yeah, email yeah. You, know? you have all of uh, their email addresses and stuff. But I don't really. That's use so that interesting. Much. And what about um? Do you find that um, like there's a lot of I guess uh, does the school give you guidance about how to be a good digital citizen, how to use the internet responsibly. Like, do you get taught that? Is that a thing yeah. either at home or at school? Or, like, how does that work? No, it's it's definitely uh, way more at uh, school than at home. Um, like, at school, uh, we have this class called Seminar, which is basically, um, it's only a class for seventh graders. Mm. Um, so it's a class on, like, organization and just figuring out parts of your life. So um, we have, like, uh, people come in and talk about bias. People come in and talk about, like, web safety, internet safety, um, where we just started, like, a unit on it. Wow. So it's, it's actually taught in school a lot. And uh, we also have, like, health class, which is, um, like, I feel like it's more like social and sexual health. But yeah. um, sometimes it does, like, veer off onto, like, internet and online health. And, yeah, I definitely feel like at school they do put a lot of, like, since I've been in school, like, since fifth grade onward, I think there's really been, like, a lot of focus on, like, cyberbullying and, like, posting uh, mean things, strange things, stuff like that. That's really good because it is kind of scary. I assume, like, that's something that you probably see at school and it's something that needs to be dealt with. So it's good that they're talking about it. I don't know if they're talking about it at every school, but no. at least, do you think it helps? Like, what is the big thing you've learned from that? Um, well, uh, the big thing that I've learned from that is really... Um, if you do post anything or say anything that's like on technology or by text, you have to be, uh, you have to want to see your teachers. Like you want your teachers to be able to read it and like be perfectly fine with it. Yes. Um, uh, I say not my parents because I feel like my parents would be like slightly more tolerant. Um, but like, you know, your teacher's looking at it like from an academic or professional standpoint, if you don't want other people to see it, then you probably shouldn't be like saying it at all. Yeah. That's a good rule of thumb. Yeah. A good heuristic. It's the classic. That's the old thing. Like don't, if you don't want, don't do anything you wouldn't want to see written about in the newspaper, yeah. um, is a, is a, is a thing. I mean, we all, I mean, we all sometimes do stupid things, but, <laughs> but you try. Um, all right. So, so oh, and, uh, yeah. about, about the schools, um, I actually feel like it is being, like, at least in New York. I've been to three schools already, and mm -hmm. I've, like, taught it about, like, at every single school. So maybe it's, like, growing a little bit. Um, I'm not really sure, like, in a complete mindset, but everybody that I do know has at least had, like, one classroom period dedicated to it. That's impressive. That's, yeah, I, I feel good about that. They've been doing a really good job. That's cool. Well, D Diego, you've told us so many, I mean, I've really enjoyed our conversation, and I feel pretty inspired to go do a hackathon this weekend or something. So if you need people on your team, you should tell me. Um, this is the show about finding the power to choose what you actually want in business and life and the courage to miss out on everything else. So if somebody's listening today and they're like, man, I, I want to do something like that. I want to go start a company. I want to try something new. Like, What's your advice to anybody, kid, adult, anybody? Yeah, um, well, uh, about uh, missing out and like fear of like picking something and doing something. Mm -hmm. Um, I usually like to think back um, at this moment um, in uh, uh, Moab, Utah. I was standing on top of this cliff looking out 80 feet over the side. And at that point, like, I was pretty scared, but I wasn't thinking about should I get a helicopter? Should I just, like, go back around the way we came? No, I put my harness on and set over the side and went, like, 
this is like the option that I have now. This is a good one. I should probably focus on this instead of staying up here for the rest of my life and becoming like some statue on top of there. Um, and I just went straight down, you know. Um, it's really not about picking uh, like the greatest and best option. Even if you have to settle for second best, it is an option, you know. If you like come up to a wall, you're not going to wait around until somebody builds a door into the side of it. You're going to climb over it. Yeah. That's great advice. I like that. That's, wow, that's, that's some wisdom. Um, all right. And if, if people are, want to follow your adventures and learn more about you, where can they do that? Uh, well, I wish I had a website. I would, um, I've actually been uh, thinking about getting a LinkedIn because everybody keeps asking me, like, oh, you have a LinkedIn. And I'm like, no, I'm 12. I don't have any. <laughs> I know. It's kind of weird, um, right? It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's strange. I can't, I, I, you know, it's, it's your, you know, it's, it would be, there, there's going to be a right time for that. It may not be yeah. right now. But... I think, you know, people, you just need to be, you know, keep, you need to set your Google alert for Google, for Diego to make sure that, then, you know, in a couple of years when he's doing even more exciting things that you get informed about it. And of course, maybe we'll have you back on the show to tell us about some of your adventures in the Thanks. future. Thank, Thank you for being here. Thanks. All right, everybody. Um, and now I want to uh, obviously transition to the final part of the show, the part that um, is our full moment of the week. And today's full moment of the week comes from uh, a trip that I just took recently, and it shows you that FOMO is literally everywhere. So I happened to be in Cairo, Egypt, and I was speaking at this, uh, this annual meeting for a group called Endeavor, which if you don't know about it, endeavor.org. It's an incredible entrepreneurship organization. And I started talking about FOMO, and I thought maybe a few people in the room would know about it. There were probably about 100 people there. And so I said, who in this room knows about the term FOMO? And about 75 people raised their hands, including in the front row, the woman who was the Minister of Industry and Trade. And so afterwards, we got to chat, and she said, I have terrible FOMO. I love that you are here. It's incredible. And I thought to myself, if you can go halfway across the world to Cairo, Egypt, and find people with FOMO and then actually know the word, clearly, um, my work is cut out for me. And so with that, uh, I want to thank you for joining me today on FOMO Sapiens. Uh, if you want to find out more about me, you can go to patrickmcginnis.com. And if you like the podcast, uh, definitely uh, give us a five-star rating, a review, and share this podcast with your friends. So thanks for being here. Uh, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time on FOMO Sapiens. <laughs>